What's going on, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of JAR. JAR, for those of you that may be new, stands for Joe. And Amy. Review. This is our weekly show where we go over the magic stories that are put up on Magic's website or Wizard's website. Uh, this week, we have the story Judgment by both Doug Beyer and Allison Lures. It is the final story in the Amonkhet set of stories. It is not the final in the Amonkhet block. We'll get to Hour of Devastation, and we'll talk about that towards the end. But, like I said, this was Judgment. Um... This story was not as long as I expected it to be, for our brief review at the beginning. Not as long as I expected it to be, still very good. Um, if you are aware of the two story spotlight cards that we hadn't gotten to yet, they kind of, you kind of knew where the sto this story was going from the beginning, but the way that they got us there was very good and I enjoyed it, and so I do encourage you uh, as I usually do, to, to go read the story first before coming here. As we always say, we review, we do not summarize. Right. Do you do you agree? Did you feel the same way about the story? Yeah, absolutely. It was very, very good. Uh, and so you should definitely check that out before coming back here for the full review, which, speaking of the full review, let's get into it. Um, I mean, again, great story. Doug Beyer and Allison Lures are amazing. They are, you know, very uh, classic writers of the stories. They've always done an amazing job, and we've reviewed many of their stories in the past. Um, and I just love Allison. I love both of them. You know, I, I, I appreciate both of them for what they do, and from all the times that we've seen them interacting with the audience and things like that, I, I just, I've always appreciated that. So, um, but yeah, so these, one thing that, if we're talking about the authors for a second, one thing that I wished was, Allison tweeted out at some point today that uh, she wrote, this, that she was responsible for the second half, and that she was so excited to do the second half that she actually wrote it before the last story that she wrote in this string of stories, <laughs> um, which is funny. I mean, that that's great. You know, I'm glad for her that, that she was so excited, and it was very good. It was, you know, all of the fighting and stuff that was going on at the... Uh, at the trial of zeal for Hazaret, and I thought it was very, very good. What I wished was, and maybe they were hoping that it would kind of gel together and you wouldn't notice, and that's fair, um, but I kind of wished that they would have separated it and said which parts were written by whom, or yeah. where the separation was, where it ended, if it was a bright line like that, if it wasn't, you know, that they kind of collaborated or whatever uh, for it. I, I just... Because we know the authors so well of these wow. different stories. We don't know the authors. Well, you know what I mean. We, we know their writing style. Right. We are familiar with their writing style so well from seeing the other stories that they've written. I wished that it had been separated so that we would know definitively. And I'm sure going back in, it's not very hard to tell where that delineation is. But still, it was definitely something that I was was hoping for. Yeah, it would, it would have been cool to just have a little bit of... Um you know, context in, you know, appreciating the author of each separate section. Correct, and, and right. And the strengths and, and particular strengths of those individual sections and, you know, what was the best part of the first half, what was the best part of the second half, stuff like that. Yeah. Um, one thing that I found a little confusing, and it may have been the shift between Doug and um, Allison writing, was the perspective seemed to change halfway through the story and I wasn't sure what the second perspective was. I wasn't sure because it seemed to be that the first half was told from Samut's perspective right. entirely. The second half, once you got into it, it was kind of Samut and it was done a little bit cheekier because it was like, you know, Samut has no idea who the Gatewatch are. Right. And so she's like, oh, well, now there's this person who's introducing herself as Chandra. And this strong guy or sturdy man, I think was the words that were used, um, who introduces himself as Gideon. And, you know, now I've met these two and now there's these two. And at one point they refer to Gideon talking to the woman in violet, meaning Liliana. But then later on, they just mention the fact that they're in the Gatewatch. Like, the story mentions the fact that they're in the Gatewatch, and it's like, okay, but then whose perspective is this being told from? Right. Is it is it Samut's perspective and we don't know who the Gatewatch are and, and just know their names and just barely? I, or, I think it 
became at that point just our perspectives as the reader. Well, but that's the thing, right? It, it's it's it, th that's a perspective in writing. We've we've talked about this in in past jars in this set, I believe, that it's a third person omnipotent perspective or a you know a, just a straight omnipotent perspective where they know everything that's being thought by everyone else or whatever. It it. It just, it felt odd because like you said, it did, it, I agree that it felt like it was just to help the reader, but it, I felt like it jumped back and forth almost between like telling us what things about the Gatewatch that some wouldn't have known to talking about the Gatewatch as if we're not familiar with who they are as if we were Samut. And it was, it was a little confusing, a little bit. That's not a huge dilemma. It's just something that caused me pause every once in a while. I was like, uh, that, that's a little odd. Why is it like that? I don't know. I, I didn't get that feeling. I okay. thought it was okay. All right. Fair enough. Let us know, as always, in the comments. Do you agree, disagree yeah, with either of Yeah, maybe I'm just not recalling... But yeah, I don't know. It, it didn't. It didn't feel incorrect, you know, or or odd. Well, to and me. and like I like I was trying to get at. I, this in no way ruined the story. It's just a point to bring up in the review. That's all. Okay. Um, yeah. The the other thing I wanted to talk about was, and we talked about this last week. And at the end uh, of this video, you'll see last week's video linked if you missed it. Um. But last week we talked about, um, or t I'm sorry, it was actually two weeks ago, <laughs> but we talked about um, two story spotlight cards being shared in one story. And that was done two weeks ago with Cruel Reality yeah. followed by Anointed Procession. Yeah. And I commented... Yeah, sort of Anointed Procession. Well, that was just going to say, and I commented on the fact that Anointed Procession felt a little shoehorned in, in my opinion. I didn't feel like it felt shoehorned in. I felt like it was missing. Right. And it was and, just... And so I kind of expected it to to show up a little bit more in the next story, which it didn't. It did not. It. You could argue that it showed up for a brief moment here in yeah. this one because all of the Gatewatch kind of came together and talked about what they learned at their separate points throughout this... Right. Their trip to Amonkhet. And you know, so to me, <clears throat> this story me. highlighted all three of those story spotlights in my mind. Fair, except that we saw it two weeks ago, or two stories ago. And and it, again, it was in the care. same one as Cruel Reality. Well, but that's what I mean, you know, it's it's... How do you define that card being shown? Do you define it as when that moment is described to you and the picture is shown? Or do you define it as when it is impactful? I, I, def I define it as when it is explained. And I define it as the we are in that moment that is occurring at that moment, and then most of the time they show us that picture of that card as well to yeah, be descriptive enough. I feel like a lot of the pictures that they show aren't really at the moment. They did a good, a, a better job of that, I feel like, in this set. Usually it was just, oh, we're talking about a bat, so throw the picture of the bat in the set right. up there again. You know, and it, it's like every time, or with Shadows Over Innistrad, a lot of the descriptions of the um, stuff from Shadows Over Innistrad would show cards from original Innistrad, and it was like, okay, I mean, you're getting your point across, but... This is a whole new set. Maybe show cards from your new set as opposed to... Right, but I think at the same time, because that was a return to sort of set, I think they were trying to sort of give those callbacks in an effort to create some sort of... I don't know. I... They, they, they wanted to get people excited for the new set by showing pictures from the old set in the story mm -hmm. to kind of show how the two intertwined and, and rather that's... than sort of treating it as its own entity because it was supposed to be a continuation. And that's fine. And I think that works. I just am commenting on the fact that in my opinion, it's gotten, it's gotten better in their, their choices that they've made of what pictures to put up when right. from which cards. And they really do seem to reflect appropriately what is being shown in the story, which is both a testament to 
the research and development team and the story team and their collaborations with one another in saying like, okay, these are the things that the story is going to do. How about we make cards for that? And even if they're not story spotlight cards necessarily, they're still, you know, when we saw the Amit in um, The Trial of Ambition, I believe, in, in uh, two weeks ago, they showed the Baleful Amit card. Now, technically, Amits yeah. were again mentioned tonight, but there's no need to show the Amit, the Baleful Amit for that. You just are aware of what Amits are, and but it was it worked perfectly to show Baleful Amit at that moment in that story. I just thought it was really good. Well, I, I also think that it's due to the fact that they've specifically in the story started naming cards mm -hmm. as part of a sentence. Mm -hmm. You know, they'll just say, oh, well, this person's this thing, you know, and it's like, okay, well, that is a card. Um, and I, there are times where I feel like it's a little pandery and times where I feel like it's kind of cool. Um, so I feel like as long as they're carefully... Um, treading that line and they're not crossing over to that pandery side too much uh, I feel like that's a good a good thing for them to be doing because then they can highlight it with the pictures in a more effective way um, but Sorry. once it starts to feel a little bit like okay well now you're just reading off the card names in the story then it just gets to be ridiculous and, and why are you reading it at that point? I agree with you, but I will also say that I am aware of the fact that we are... That is not the only opinion out there. I feel like there are some people, similar to movies, for example. There are people out there in movies or television shows who love that moment in the movie or the TV show where that one character says the name of the movie <laughs> at some point throughout their interactions. And they'll do that, and people will be like, yeah, that's awesome. And other people will be like, ugh, yeah. really? I'm, I'm one of those ugh people. Right. I'm one of those people who wishes that when that happens, I could just reach through the screen and punch the person in the face. <laughs> like, okay, nope, you're gone from the movie now. And, and like I said, I agree with you, but I'm aware that that's not everybody. Right. That there are some people who are like, oh, sweet, this is cool. So I, I get that. That's fine. Um... I will also point out, talking about the story spotlight cards, kind of going back to it, um, there were two in this one, like I said, similar to two weeks ago. And similar to two weeks ago, <laughs> it, the card is called By Force. Sure, technically, from Samut's perspective, Chandra burned her way through the sarcophagus and split the sarcophagus in half to get Samut out and, and the other dissenters who happened to be there. But you wouldn't know it no, from the story. <laughs> you wouldn't, because it was a throwaway line, yeah. very similar to Anointed Procession. It was and just... It's, and it's weird, because it, at that point, it's still, for the most part, from Samut's perspective. And... So you would think that there would be more time spent on her talking about how the sarcophagus that she is just in is now being burned as she's in it so that she can be released. Because mm -hmm. that would be a freaking big deal yeah. if you were inside that thing when yeah. that was happening. Yeah, yeah. Now, partially to contrast it, but almost not, with Gideon's intervention. Gideon's intervention occurred, and I guess this is where Amy and I differ in our opinions of what shows a relevant reason for a story spotlight card. It was shown later on, or it was discussed later on, where Gideon finds out that in that moment when he stepped up, Hazaret spoke to him in his mind. and um, But that moment when Gideon actually did it, Gideon's actual intervention for that moment where it was described, again, my opinion as to when that card is portrayed, still Samut's perspective. To the point where Samut is on the ground and notices a clang and a golden light and then turns around to see Gideon and oh, says... Oh, a shimmery thing. Right, and says, and says, oh, he does keep his promises. Oh, wait, I'm focused on Jeru again. Yeah. So it, it, 
in the moment that it was told, again, which is when, in my opinion, it matters, it was an afterthought. It was, like, for a second. Now, to go from Amy's perspective, and, and now that I've learned that that is another, a different way of looking at it, Gideon's intervention was very important in this story because of the continuation at the end when they jumped to Gideon and his thoughts, and he talked about how Hazaret spoke to him and what she said, and that he was afraid for the first time in a while, and noticed the blood, blood right, and that he wasn't comfortable with that right. because he's supposed to be invulnerable all the time. So you know, and how he, I think he said how easily it flowed out of him, and she said, Hazaret said to him, "I I see your death. You are no god." And right, his it, you know her way of telling him, like, look, yes. You're impervious to things, but gods and probably Nicol Bolas still gonna kill your ass. Well, so here's here's the thing. I'm, I'm <laughs> glad that I'm glad that you brought up Nicol Bolas though, because I think that it's a very interesting parallel to draw. Hazaret, a literal god, said to Gideon, a planeswalker, "Don't forget." Basically, paraphrasing, "Don't forget." You're not a god. I am. And yet, Nicol Bolas is coming. He's not a god. He convinced them all that he was a god. Right. And either brainwashed them or whatever into thinking that, but he's not. Yeah. And the whole point of Jeru and Samut's kind of venture, or mostly Samut's venture, in this story was to get Hazaret to help when Nicol Bolas does show up, it's like, listen, you need to help us. He is the trespasser. He is the one who, ne who needs to be stopped, and you can help us stop him. I still believe in you, is something that Samot said to Hazaret in, in her mind, in her prayers. Right. And so that will be interesting to see where that goes once Hour of Devastation stories come out, is whether or not Hazaret still has that feeling if and when she realizes Nicol Bolas' true intent right. and, and, and what and he's I done. I think what they did with that part of the story was extremely cool. Yes. Because it gave us a real sense of Hazaret's not just there, here's a dissenter, and then kills a dissenter, right. which could have happened. But it very much went through Samut's feelings as... She talked to Hazaret, saying things that Hazaret should not have been appreciative of hearing, okay? <laughs> um, and yet, she still felt comforted by the love that Hazaret had for her. Right, and that could be the aura similar to what Oketra was giving off. Yeah. And Hazaret has magic, as we saw, to kind of infuriate and, you know, embroaden her people and, and, and make them all kind of bloodthirsty. And, um, you know, the, I think what you were talking about before was Hazaret's fervor yes. being uh, literal words that were mentioned in the story, but also an actual card. That art that was, was not shown. That was a punch moment. That, right. was a, that was a cool moment. Well, and that art wasn't shown in that moment, but Pursue Glory's art was shown when it first occurred. And it was, you know, kind of the halo of red. Yeah, and, that was cool. Right. And and it making them all angry and want to kill. And the, the, the Gatewatch kind of all realizing that they didn't have their magic or access to yeah. their magic. Which, again, that was the moment kind of where it was like, Samut doesn't know any of this. Right. Why... Why is Samut discussing these things, or right. why is it, so it... That was the weird perspective part. But. Right, and that kind of felt to me like, if you're going to have these sections of this story from Samut's perspective, that's fine. Which is great. But it was then, great. But then you need to come back to them. You need to readdress those parts of the story again from a different perspective. And I think they just switched perspectives and didn't readdress those things that I feel they really needed to readdress... Um, in order to make it make sense and give enough to those moments. And they really didn't give enough to those moments because of that. Um, because it was just from Simon's perspective and she 
knew so little of them and their capabilities and why they were setting her free and all of these things. Right. And I think that they did a good job of, of doing what you were asking for, which is switching that perspective and going back to it with Gideon at the end. Yeah. Because I, it was like... I wish, that, I, I wish that they had just picked up where they left off before that section. Oh, fair. From a, you know, and here's the same section again from a different perspective. Yeah. And then we can finish the story afterward. Like right. they do with TV shows and movies mm -hmm. frequently. Mm -hmm. um, because then, it, it, you know, there would have been adequate information given to... Uh, maybe they didn't do that because they felt... Well, the audience knows this stuff, so we'll just show the audience just what Samut knows. And that's kind of cool, um, but I feel like that's presuming a little bit. Yeah, and, and again, maybe, I doubt it, but maybe an Hour of Devastation it comes up where they're all like, wasn't that crazy when we didn't have our magic, you know, access to our magic. Again, I doubt that's Lame. what will happen. I don't think so. I, I really don't think so, because I think because it finished with... Bolus's basic arrival. Um, Almost. He wasn't actually Ultimately, there. he is, like, on their doorstep. Right. It's the, <laughs> the, uh, the coming of the hours. Right. Yes. So, because of that, because it escalated to that point, I don't think they're going to readdress less important things at this point. Mm -hmm. I don't think they're going back to, to those things. I think the things that they will address is um, Hazaret and the way in which Samut may or may not have slightly interfered with her thinking. Mm -hmm. um, you know, obviously they'll, they'll go back to Gideon and his, you know, um, his vulnerability. Um, and, yeah, I mean, I, I, I'm sure they'll address in some way um, the fact that the hours and Bolas are the, you know, are the manipulations of this world and of these gods mm -hmm. um, because they have to in order to try and get more of a of an army of dissenters together. Mm -hmm. And because the dissenters at this point don't really fully understand why they're dissenters. Right. Sama um, does, but she seems to be the only one. Right. Seemingly. Um... But, so she can kind of, or they can kind of, whoever can kind of try to use that information as much as possible and spread it around to get the dissenters to understand more fully uh, what is happening and that they need to fight against either the gods or uh, just Nicol Bolas if they can convince the gods to fight alongside them, you know, whatever right. it's going to be. Right. Um, so those things are the things that they'll refer back to. Um, those other things that we were mentioning uh, are, are not going to happen. Yeah. Um, and and because the, the point that they should have happened was in this story, and they really didn't happen fully mm -hmm. because of the fact that it was from Samuel's perspective. And I'm not, again, I'm not saying that that was the wrong thing to do. Having it from Sam's perspective was really cool in yeah. certain moments. I liked it a lot. Because we got to learn what she knows. Mm -hmm. Because we only knew this much of what she knows. Yes. Because we didn't really know her. She wasn't really a character. She was just a, um, you know, somebody in the background in the beginning. Yep. You know? Um, she was the woman who yelled right. in the beginning and then who was mentioned by Jero in their crop later. And was a dissenter. You know, we, right. we, we didn't really know Samut. And so we got to meet and, and know Samut and the story, which was really cool. Um, but again, there were certain sections where telling it from her perspective didn't give those moments their due. Um, yeah, and we, I, I liked the fact that we got to learn about Samut solely, besides, like I mentioned, besides her yelling in the street and then um, Jeru and the crop mentioning her but not mentioning her during the Trial of Ambition. I liked that we only got to know her through last week's story and this week's story, and yet it felt good. It felt right. I appreciated being with her through her own personal trial, if you right. will, of trying to save Jeru and etc. And the ups and downs of her, you know, not knowing, like knowing that she wanted to be loyal to Noct 
and and his beliefs and and help her friends with what she saw and telling them but knowing that it wouldn't work and right. kind of naively being like well Jeru's the only one who could convince a god yeah that's just weird it is a little weird to me i think it's just i think she's i think she's in love with him and oh, so yeah. she sees him as being a lot more than he is but yeah. but we'll go on to see Hopefully. what he is i mean Hopefully. you know we'll, we'll we'll see how right she is about what he's capable of. Mm -hmm. Now, we've discussed this a lot throughout this entire series. I mean, as you can see below, there are many episodes. But throughout this series, we've talked about this a lot. And it's the Planeswalkers from Amon Ket were three Gatewatch Planeswalkers in Gideon, Nyssa, and Liliana, in my opinion. And you may agree with me and or disagree. And you may agree or disagree. In this set, in my opinion, and maybe you can guess it, there are two Planeswalkers who were loyal of having themselves in this set based on their degree of character development and presence within the stories, and one who really didn't. I think, and I wanted to give you a second to think about who that might be, who's the one who doesn't belong in this set, I think it's Liliana. Nyssa really showed us why she has blue mana now. Gideon? Yeah. Come on. Gideon of the trials. Yeah. He went through the trials. He was present with Oketra, etc. Liliana spoke with Jace and saw some mummies in that one story. Now, we have reviewed Mark Rosewater's articles, Odds and Ends articles, where he has answered questions similar to this, or problems that people have had similar to this before, and so I want to touch on it so that I'm not just like, they, they screwed up entirely, there's no way. <laughs> the reason I think that she was here, and it, it will remain to be seen if or whom the second Planeswalker is in the, or the second and third Planeswalkers are, in Hour of Devastation. Because Nicol Bolas is going to be in Hour of Devastation, almost definitively, because of Dark Intimations. But because Nicol Bolas is part black, at least has been in the past, they could throw a, a you know, change it up on us, but because Nicol Bolas has been part black and may well be part black again, they may not have wanted to give us Liliana in this set as well, in, in Hour of Devastation as well, so that you just have two black planeswalkers in the same set, yeah. because it might be a little over the top. Um, but it could also be, like I said, we have to see what the other color identities are of the other one or two planeswalkers, if there are one or two other planeswalkers besides Nicol Bolas, because I know they try to keep it to a certain number or at least representing one of each color, and now, you know, technically, once Bolas comes around, they will un almost undoubtedly have done that, um, because we're missing, what well, we had green and blue with Nyssa, we had black with Liliana, and white with uh, Gideon, so we're only really missing red, and Bolas has been part red in the past as well, so all five colors of Planeswalker will technically exist if Nicol Bolas is the same colors we know him to be, but... I thought it was odd that Liliana was in this set, and yet it wasn't really impactful. I mean, sure, in this story, she admitted to the rest of the Gatewatch that her other demon is here. But again... I think it's not impactful yet. Correct. That's what we'll go on to see. Because I, I think what happened in, in the beginning isn't impactful, but... It will be impactful because we'll see, oh, Liliana can control all of these mummies. So I think we'll go on to see how that really affects can she control, whether positively or negatively. Can she control the mummies or the zombies in the desert? Oh, is that what it was? I think so. Yeah, because the, the mummies, mummies were fanning her. The oh, mummies, oh, yeah. yeah, but that was because she asked them to because they'll do whatever anyone uh, asks in that area, but they're controlled by the cartouches. Yeah, but I, but I don't think they would have just, I don't know. I, I, I guess I thought that she was controlling the mummies 
in doing that because no, they're not just going to do that for somebody who's just randomly there. No, Temet... Not an actual, like, resident of the area. Temet gave them a place to stay and told the mummies to do okay. whatever they needed. Because if you remember when Nissa needed water by that, when she was going for her walk, I'm pretty sure an anointed went and got her water. Yeah. I could be wrong. No, you're that's right. just from my memory. Right. I believe that that's what occurred. So, regardless, you're. I think you're right. Apart from what I just felt like I corrected you on, the, 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 the part that I think that you are absolutely right about is I think Liliana will be impactful in Hour of Devastation. My point is I assume that she was not put in Hour of Devastation because it would clash with the other Planeswalker identities that will be in Hour of Devastation, and so they put her in Amonkhet because she's important to the story of this block, but not necessarily that one set because she's going after her third demon and she knows of Nicol Bolas and used to be, you know. Well, I think it was an Arlen Cord situation where they put her in to introduce the fact that part of the story is going to be about these things that are not going to be addressed right away. Well, the other... And, and, and then they'll be addressed in the second half, but... They want to put her in the first half because then it matters that those things were originally addressed, you know, initially. Okay, I mean... We, we, we can't address them in the second part and give a damn unless we've been introduced beforehand. Right. To why that matters. Now, okay, and Arlen Cord was introduced in Shadows Over Innistrad in the words of Mark Rosewater, if I remember correctly, because of, also because of the fact that she was a red-green werewolf planeswalker and, in El and a, a mythic at that. And in Eldritch Moon, there was also a red-green mythic werewolf that flipped. And they didn't want two of them in the same set because that is confusing and a pain to have to have them both. It's just, it's too much design space to be taken up in one location, which again is why I made the, the estimation of Liliana being a black planeswalker versus Nicol Bolas being part black as well. That's That was my only, you know, comment there for, for that rationale. And we will have to see. Like I said, we, we will 100% have to see on that. Yeah. I, I feel like there was not a whole lot to talk about with this story because it was kind of those two main parts of uh, Samut going to talk to Hazaret and then being thrown in the sarcophagus, being taken out of the sarcophagus, going to the Trial of Zeal, and then the ending of the Trial of Zeal. And we, we kind of knew most of that. We didn't know... I assumed Samut would just have been in the sarcophagus from the start of the story because we hadn't seen her since uh, she was running through the streets yelling and she even said that she got dragged off by the anointed, so I assumed they just put her in the sarcophagus and she would have just been there. But instead, there was a little bit before that as well. And so, you know, that's fine. That's then how we got there. And you get to see both sides of the, the Hazaret conversation and learn a little bit more about Hazaret, which I'm sure will come to be important. Yes. Um, especially since she was stated multiple times, and I believe this is the first time that we learn this about Hazaret, but that it was stated multiple times that she was the chosen of the god pharaoh, the chosen daughter of the god pharaoh, despite the fact that three of the gods are female in Bantu, Oketra, and Hazaret. Um, also, sure, all five gods were in this story, but we haven't seen or heard from Ronus yet in any of these stories, who's the... the green serpent god. We've heard from Kefnet when Nyssa spoke to him. We've heard from Hazaret now a couple of times, Oketra a couple of times, and Bantu during the trial, but we haven't really heard from Ronus. Right. We've heard about Ronus. So I'm curious if Ronus is just, hey, we needed a green god and there needs to be a trial of strength, or if Ronus will play a part in Hour of Devastation right. and we'll have I'm to see. Right. So who knows? Fingers crossed. We, we'll, we'll find out what's going on with all of that. We will have to wait, I think they said three more weeks. Next week... That's not that bad. It's not. Next week is... Yeah, because we had we had to wait six weeks with the... Yeah, it was crazy. Or seven or something before these. Um, next week is the MTG Story podcast. 
So we'll be returning to that. Um, that'll be released on the same day as these stories are, so we will cover that for JAR, yes. as we have in the past. Uh, the week after that is a Commander story, which have been oh. meh in the past. Okay. We will see how that goes. And then the week after that, which I believe is July 7th, but I could be wrong, as I've said before, but I believe I remember that correctly, but it's that Wednesday in July. Um, that, that is when we will return to Hour of Devastation stories, finding out what the hours mean, etc. Um, just to double check, you are you good? Yeah. I want to make sure I'm not so. cutting you off on yeah. anything. I, I don't know. Sitting down <clears throat> here, I felt like I had no idea what I was going to say, and like there wasn't going to be very much for me to say, but obviously there was, because... Because we've been here. So... Guys, let us know what you thought of our review in the comments down below. Let us know what you thought of this story in the comments yes, down below. Yes, please. We, we actually care what you thought. Yes. So and not just of our video, but of the story. We, we want to, you know, compare our opinions. Yes. That's a fun thing for us. <laughs> so, you can, you can check out our um, links. They'll be popping up randomly over here. There's the subscribe button that'll pop up over here as well. Um, uh, thank you for allowing us throughout Amon Ket. We're definitely not going away, but thank you since this is the end of Amon Ket. Thank you for following us through all of Amon Ket if you have or part of Amon Ket to allow us to show off our... Hashtag Borthos Pride. And you guys should continue to do the same as well. Check us out on Facebook and Twitter. Those links are down in the description box below. This has been Jar yep. on Geek For All. I've been Joe. And I'm Amy. And as we always say, guys, in whichever video of ours you watch next... We will see you all next time. Thanks, everybody.